scripture reading today in God's Word is Luke 11, 23, 28. He who is not with me is against me, and he who does not gather with me scatters. When an evil spirit comes out of a man, it goes through various places seeking rest and does not find it. Then it says, I will return to the house I left. When it arrives, it finds the house swept clean and put in order. Then it goes and takes seven other spirits, more wicked than itself, and they go in and live there. And the final condition of that man is worse than the first. As Jesus was saying these things, the woman in the crowd called out, Blessed is the mother who gave you birth and nursed you. He replied, Blessed brethren are those who hear the word of God and obey it. So be it. thank you so much that we can enjoy the fellowship that we have through the Spirit. We thank you for the safe haven that we can come to worship you. We thank you that you would call us to be your very own children. May your Spirit just tie us together, Lord, and teach us today as we listen to your Word. We just pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. So this message is called Fill Her Up. What does that mean? Do you have any idea what it means? Mikey, do you have any idea what it means? Because see, y'all never have been to a full-service gas station, have you? You don't even know what a full-service gas station is. I do. Huh? And you miss it? On your bulletins, you'll see a picture. Now, that one's before me, because that one's from the 50s. But used to, when you went to the gas station, you pulled in the gas station, they pumped your fuel for you. Not just because you were in Oregon. No, no, no. They did all kind of things. They said... Can I check under your hood? And they checked the oil. They checked your antifreeze level. They checked your wipers, see how they were. They got out there and cleaned your windshield. And you can see all those different things there. That's what you got for 20 cents a gallon. Now we pay $3 a gallon and we pump it ourselves, right? What's wrong with this? But there's a good scriptural message here. Because, see, we try so many times to do God's work under our own abilities when we have a full service spirit laying right inside of us there all the time ready and willing to help us through this life. If you're not coming to Romans on Sunday night, you might want to come tonight because it's about where Paul says that we continue to struggle with our own power and our own might instead of living life by the Spirit. Romans chapter 7, if you've never read it, never really studied it, Paul sits there and he's probably one of the, the greatest Christians of all times. And he says, why do I do the things that I don't want to do? Why do I still continue with this? And the reason being is because he's trying to live by his own power and his own might still. When he's been given God Almighty inside of him. Why would we still try to keep living that same way? Why would we rent from one place and we didn't like this landlord and we had all kind of problems and we move into this other neighborhood that's nice and everything, that's got everything that we need, swimming pool, amenities, everything. Why would we go back to the old landlord 
and ask him questions about our new place of residence. Right? So if you're not familiar with full service gas stations, maybe you've seen Back to the Future. Yeah. Yeah, see, remember when Marty McFly goes in there and all the attendants come up and he had no clue what was going on? That was a full service gas station. This is an article from Go Retro. It says, The gas station of yesterday put today's modern filling stations to shame. It's insulting that we must pay close to $4 a gallon for gas, often pump it ourselves, and not get any kind of reward or thanks for our patronage. For me, one of the most memorable scenes from, from Back to the Future is when Marty McFly, upon landing in his hometown during the 1950s, witnesses a full-service gas station. It's, it's something, if you've not seen it, it's amazing. A car pulls up and out of the station springs four uniformed attendants who not only fill the tank, check the tire pressure and the oil, wash the car's windows. These perks were free and it was the norm up until the 1970s. Not only that, but gas stations often gave away trinkets. Do you remember that? Drinking glasses and so forth. Toys, keychains, calendars. They wanted your business. Imagine that. They gave trading stamps and even road maps. Exxon was known for giving away a plush tiger's tail that you could affix to your gas cap or your bicycle. So if you had a gas cap lid, you had a little tiger tail sticking out of it. Okay? What was the slogan? There's a tiger in your tank. That was the slogan. <clears throat> Put a tiger in your tank was the slogan, and this was done with service and a smile. The oil crisis of the 1970s marked the beginning of the end of the full service station. Oil companies figured that customers wanted to pump their own gas in exchange for saving a few pennies. And look where we're at today. Pretty soon the attendants were no longer needed. Although the process of getting gas at a full service station took about 10 to 15 minutes, which sadly no one today would even do. They wouldn't have 10 or 15 minutes to spare, would we? Because that's the life we live. We're too busy. You think that has any bearing on the fact that we don't live spirit-filled lives? We don't sit down and spend that 10 to 15 minutes, let alone longer than that, with God, asking Him for direction for the day, asking Him for power that's there already. So I think this describes what we're seeing in Luke chapter 11. The people of that day were so self-centered, so distracted with life, that they missed out on what Jesus was offering. They wanted a Jesus where they could put their quarter in the machine and get what they wanted, but they didn't want to wait around. They wanted that and go, and that's all they wanted. They certainly didn't want a Lord. They might want a Savior, but they never wanted a Lord. They didn't want full-service Jesus. But guess what? We have full-service Jesus right here. He said, I am not going to leave you as orphans, but I'm going to ask the Father to send you the Comforter, the Healer. The Holy Spirit has so many titles and names given to Him in the Bible. There's nothing that God can't do, and He lives inside of each and every believer. So what did they do? They got their fill, and they went off to indulge yourselves like we do today when we fill our tanks. We've got many other things that we've got to do. We're too busy to, to think about Jesus. We might be justified. We might be set free from sin. But a lot of Christians never go through the process of sanctification. They never learn what it's like to have a tiger in their tank. But you do. It's there. You were filled to capacity when you were born again. But you've got to tap into that. To let the Spirit fill your tank, check your tire pressure, your oil, your windshield wipers, and so forth, so that you can see clearly that you have the fuel that you need for the day, that you have good tires to run on when things get rough and slippery, so that you can have victory in Jesus in this world. Because the kingdom of God is at hand. We talked about that, that Luke says over and over again, the kingdom of God is at hand. He's trying to teach disciples how to live in that kingdom of God. Maybe you're not f still f familiar with what filler up means. So if you, if you Google that and look for synonyms, here's what you'll find. And these describe the Holy Spirit to a T. Feed, incite, inflame, sustain, charge, fire, gas, nourish, service, supply, fill up, and stoke up. Just imagine if we let the Holy Spirit do that in our lives. That's why Jesus asked the Father to send the Spirit. Remember also that Luke is writing an orderly account. The Messiah has come. He's writing an orderly account so we can see that that is the truth. And then in Luke 9, 
Jesus starts heading out resolutely for Jerusalem because he knows his time has come. He knows that's the Father's will. That's the purpose of his life. And he's given these final instructions to his disciples. And then at the beginning of Luke chapter 11, we have that aha moment where one disciple says, I see Jesus praying all the time. I wonder if that's got anything to do with helping him walk the walk that he needs to walk. Jesus, will you teach us how to pray? And Jesus teaches the disciples how to pray. After that, he talks about our earnest dedication to prayers. That the, a neighbor may not want to come to us because he wants to come, because he's our friend, but because if we persistently keep on and keep on, that he will come and give us all that we need. And how much more will our Father give us the Holy Spirit to fill our tanks, to give us that tiger that we need to run off of? <clears throat> then Jesus casts out a demon. And we've got two responses that we see that are negative. Those that say that he's casting out a demon by the power of Satan himself. And those who say that we want more signs. He's already proven himself over and over. Jesus backs the first ones into a corner because he says, If I cast out demons in the name of the devil, then who do your people cast out demons? Well, they're not about to say that they cast them out in the name of the devil. They're going to say by the power of God. So he said, Then I must also which means that the finger of God is here and the kingdom of God is at hand. So the question there is, are you going to respond to that kingdom? Then in verse 14 of Luke 11, it says, Jesus was driving out a demon that was mute. When the demon left, the man who had been mute spoke, and the crowd was amazed. But some of them said, By Beelzebub, the prince of demons, he is driving out demons. Others tested him by asking for a sign from heaven. Jesus knew their thoughts and said to them, Any kingdom divided against itself will be ruined. A house divided against itself will fall. If Satan is divided against himself, how can his kingdom stand? I say this because you claim that I drive out demons by Beelzebub. Now if I drive out demons by Beelzebub, by whom do your followers drive them out? So then they will be your judges. But if I drive out demons by the finger of God, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. And they knew good and well what that finger of God meant from Old Testament um, literature. The kingdom of God has come. So whose kingdom do you belong to? You belong to one or the other. And if you belong to a kingdom, you serve a king. And you should be living for that king, one or the other. There is no neutral ground. So Jesus goes on to say, When a strong man fully armed guards his own house, his possessions are safe. But when someone stronger attacks and overpowers him, he takes away the armor in which the man trusted and divides up his plunder. Whoever is not with me is against me, and whoever does not gather with me scatters. That's a verse that you should take to heart. Luke eleven twenty three. 23. You might want to write it down where you don't forget. Luke eleven twenty three. 23. Because we need to be reminded of that all the time. Because there is no neutrality in Jesus. Either you're with Him or you're against Him. And the terrible thing about that is if you're not with Him, then you're scattering. And if you apply that to souls, then you're scattering souls for all of eternity because you're not living by the power of God that is inside of you in the Spirit, the power that's in your tank, to run your life, to, to live by the kingdom of God, to serve the one true King of kings and Lord of lords. So it's a verse that we should remember all of the time. The devil's kingdom is false. He is the strong man who th you think the devil made you do it. The devil has his power over me. I continue to try in my own might. And that's why I said to read Romans chapter 7 because Paul struggled with the same thing. And he says it in the present tense, so he was still struggling with it at that point in his life. A Christian is saved from the power and penalty of sin, but it doesn't mean that you won't sin. So don't beat yourself up if you do. Just get back up and ask the Holy Spirit for the power that you need. Ask for forgiveness, and it will be there. How much more will the Father give you the Spirit to those who ask? You are His child, His very own loving possession that He gave His own Son's life so that He could adopt you as His very own. Wow! So that's where we're at. We're at Luke eleven twenty three. 23. 
Are you with Jesus or are you against Jesus? And that's where Merle started reading today. And what a terrible, terrible thought it is to say that I'm just going to be neutral. I don't want to do this or that when it says there is no neutral. You can't ride the fence. If I'm not with Jesus doing the things that I know that He's putting upon my heart to do, then I am against Him and I am scattering people to eternity in hell. Do you remember or do you know who Norma McCorvey is? A lot of you don't know that name, do you? Does anybody know that name? Not who I've already told it to. Really, that's amazing that you don't know that name. Because she kind of sat in the, in the backgrounds, but she died last Saturday, so it made news. Do you know who it is now? Maybe you know her as Jane Rowe. Does that make a little more sense to you? Somebody that Satan used to get Roe versus Wade in 1973 to get it passed in this country because we're getting so much further away from the godly heritage that we belong to. She was a pawn in Satan's game to get abortion legalized for whatever reason. That wasn't her intentions or anything else. And she was far from God at the time. This was her third pregnancy. She was told in the first pregnancy that she was a whore and couldn't take care of her child. You know, that she, she was nothing but a tramp. In her second pregnancy, if I remember this right, her stepfather or something took the child. And in this third pregnancy, she said, there's got to be a way that I can get rid of this child. And she thought of it as a child because she knew that the conception had taken place and there was going to be another birth, but she didn't want to bring this child into this world. So she got hooked up with this movement, and that's why you don't hear about her, see about her, because she never really went along with it per se. She just wanted the baby gone, wanted this reason. And that became something that's precedent. And since that time, almost 60 million babies have been aborted in this country. That's not worldwide. That's this country alone. What a terrible thing that Satan had her a part of. But you know what? When she died, she died as a child of God. Jesus' blood covers anything in your life. There's nothing that you can do before and after salvation that will ever separate you from the love of God. You either accept Jesus Christ and you're sealed by the power of the Spirit, that tiger in your tank that you have 24-7, or you deny Him and you're lost. But Jesus came to seek and save those who were lost to draw them out so that He could bring them back to the Father in heaven who loved them so much that He would sacrifice His only child for them. I can't imagine the grace that Norma is getting today. Wow! Because God is not looking back upon her sins at all. He is in control. He is looking at her as His very own child because Jesus died for her and she took on Jesus' righteousness. What a God we serve. It's just amazing. I am so thankful for mercy and grace. It's hard to fathom that a holy, powerful being like we have as our God would love, choose to love us in our sinfulness and when fact that we're enemies to Him. But if you've been saved, you've been justified. But it is also God's will that you be sanctified, that you live a holy life. Problem is, is we're still that same person in our minds when we're born again. We don't think that that old person was crucified with Christ. And we still try to live by our own power and our own might. I'm saved now, so I'm going to try to start doing better. If I try to do better, what am I going to do? Fall right on my face over and over and over again. Because those temptations and desires are still there. I'm still a sinful person. I still get mad and show my fanny, right, sweetheart? Oh, yes, she said. It happens. So I need to rely on the power of God. That's where Romans 7 is. I'm a wretched man. Who will save me? And it ends with that chapter where Jesus Christ has already saved me. So Romans 8, people read that all the time. The power of the Spirit, life in the Spirit. This is what I've got to do. But if you don't realize you've got to give up that old state first, you'll never grasp onto that state that you should be in. 
Because you'll still try to keep holding on to your own power, your own might, trying to do it. And then the devil will beat you up because he'll say, you're not good enough, you're worthless. Look what has happened as a result of your past sins. Thank goodness Norma did not believe that. And she died pro-life and she died justified in God's eyes. Her debt was paid. Grace, grace, grace. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 26 says, Brothers and sisters, think of what you were when you were called. What you were, you're not anymore. Not many of us were wise by human standards. Not many were influential. Not many of noble birth. But God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. God chose the lowly things of the world and to despise things and the things that are not to nullify the things that are, so that no one may boast before Him. It is because of Him that you are in Christ Jesus, who has become for us wisdom from God, that is our righteousness, holiness, and redemption. Therefore, as it is written, let the one who boasts in the Lord, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. I think Norma Jean, nor Norma Jean, that's... Not the same Norma. <laughs> I think Norma McCorvey is boasting today in Jesus Christ. I really, really do. I think she understands grace. And see, we need to understand that to see what we have. Jesus left this earth. He's not here to walk with us day by day now. I used to think the disciples had it so great because they got to walk with Jesus. But if you'll no notice when you read Scripture that on the night He died, where were they? Because they were still sinful men, not empowered by the Spirit at that time. At Pentecost, the Spirit came upon them, and they were totally changed men, mighty men of God. The power of a tiger in your tank is just something that you've got to experience. So here's a question for you. Is God God? Is He who He says He is? If he is, would he be satisfied with just being God when you want him to be? To be Lord when you want him to be? And the other parts of your life, he's just there, but I don't want to make him Lord of my life. The days that we decide to worship him, the days we decide to be obedient, the day, decide, the day we decide to put his will above our will, would he be satisfied and accept that? Would he appreciate our, our half-hearted allegiance half-hearted devotion and obedience. Let's go a step further. If God is God, if He says who He is, and He loved us enough that we were forever separated from Him by sin, nothing we could do about it because the wretched, pitiful person that we are, like Paul says in Romans 7, he says, there's nothing you can do about it, so I'm going to send my only son to die in your place. Isn't that exactly what happened? God is God and He loves you so, so much. And we should live a life that realizes that. And we have the power of God living inside of us to achieve that. So how is your heart's devotion? 1 John 4.10 reads, This is love. Not that we love God, but that He loved us and sent His Son as atoning sacrifice for our sins. The only reason we know how to love, have the capacity to love, is because God first loved us. As enemies, as sinners, as wretched, pitiful people who could not do anything to achieve salvation on our own, who really didn't even want salvation, we wanted to nail His Son to the cross because we didn't want a Savior like that. Sure, we wanted Him to heal our infirmities and everything, but did we want to give up our lives to make Him Lord, God, which He is? <clears throat> we want Jesus on our terms. And that's a shame. Jesus is crystal clear in this passage that we read. You cannot ride the fence. You can't be a Christian and not follow Jesus, not be like Christ. You can say you are all day long. But like I've said before, I can go sit in my garage and that does not make me an automobile or in my garage a tractor. doesn't change me. I'm still a man sitting in that garage. 
But the power of the Spirit can totally change you where you can be like Christ. Where you can be called a Christian and live like Christ. Whoever is not with Jesus without exception is against Jesus. Jesus is clear about it. And if that's not bad enough, if you're not with Him, helping Him gather up souls for all of eternity, then you're a hypocrite and you're scattering souls for all of eternity. If you ask a lot of people in this world what they think about Christians, the first thought that comes up in a lot of people's minds is hypocrite, and that's sad to say, because they don't see enough people that are like Christ. So in Luke eleven twenty three, 23, it said, Whosoever is not with me is against me, and whoever does not gather with me scatters. And then Jesus goes on to tell this story so that we can understand that further. When an impure spirit comes out of a person, it goes through arid places seeking rest and does not find it. Then it says, I will return to the house I left. When it arrives, it finds the house swept clean and put in order. Then it goes and takes seven other spirits more wicked than itself, and they go in and live there, and the final condition of that person is much worse than the first. Now, Jesus has given several neat stories here, neat examples. Some that are kind of hard to decipher until you figure it out, because you look at the first story and you say, is, is God this neighbor who doesn't seem to care? But Jesus isn't referring to God as that. He is using that example, a real life example, to show that God likes persistent prayer to see that our hearts are set on Him, that we don't give up praying when things get worse, when our prayers aren't answered the way that they're supposed to be answered. The Bible's clear again. It says in a case of divorce, even if you have the grounds of divorce and your spouse has been unfaithful, to stay with your spouse, to stay for a 50-year relationship or however long it takes, and that that may bring about the salvation of the unbelieving spouse. Prayer is not something we can just sit down and press the button and God answers. He answers in His time according to His will, but He does answer. And if we're persistent in our prayer, He will answer. And how much more will He give us the power of the Holy Spirit? So is this a parable? Is it a real story, a real consequence in somebody's life? I kind of like to think about it that way. That Jesus maybe did cast out a demon from somebody. doesn't say that Jesus cast it out, but we know that Jesus has the power over demons. This guy had a demon, and then he doesn't. Well, I don't think the demon's just going to leave him. I think Jesus had the power to cast him out. And then we see that this person cleans up his house, puts everything in order. Looks like the perfect example of what a Christian should be, right? He's got it all figured out. He's living life the way that he should live. But what happens? The demon comes back with a bunch of his buddies and takes over that house again. Why? How? Can you figure it out from the Scripture? See, the man didn't fill her up with Jesus. The house was empty. You can put everything in your life in order and you don't have the power over sin. Jesus does and He gave it to you in the power of the Spirit. If you try to do it on your own, you're always going to fail. You might sail through life pretty good for a time, but especially if you do try to start doing things for Jesus, Satan is going to attack. And if you don't have Jesus in those rooms, you don't have the Spirit in those rooms, you don't stand a chance. And what does that mean when we take that one room in the back and we cram the stuff in there that, that we didn't want to clean out? You think Satan will find that room? Because see, Jesus needs to fill that house completely. To fill that tank. You can sweep all you want to. You can clean all you want to out of your heart. But until your heart is set on Jesus. And that's why the scriptures say that. It's not our mind, it's our heart. And if your heart was focused on the allegiance of the king, you would serve the king. Especially if the king in this world, let alone God, sent his prince son out to save you, and it cost him his life. You would do everything that you could in your power to serve that king. And the Lord of all Lord, King of all kings, who commands angels, who speaks and creates cosmoses that we can't even comprehend, did that for us. 
Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father but Him. And we have the power of God if we come to Him residing inside of us. So are you willing to accept that power? Are you willing to use that power? The people in that day weren't. And so many people today aren't. I was listening to one talk show on Moody this week and she was giving some statistics and this one just stuck in my mind. I, didn't, I know that men deal with it. I've dealt with it before. But in the average church, it said that three out of five, I think is what it was, and I may have it distorted or whatever, but it was a high number of men sitting in the pews struggle with pornography today. Not in the past, but today. And that doesn't surprise me with the ease of it with the internet, the way that, that people portray themselves. doesn't surprise me at all. And if they would just realize the power of the Spirit, maybe they could overcome what they've been trying so hard on their own to overcome and can't ever do. Because we don't have the power. But the Word of God says that the devil will flee from you. Flee. And the word that is used there is that he will run into hiding because he knows that Jesus has defeated him. He's just biding his time. <clears throat> so the demon came back because the house was not filled. That's why I think it may have even been a, a real life experience rather than a parable. If you look at Luke 17, we'll see another real life example of this. Starting verse 11, it says, Now on his way to Jerusalem, Jesus traveled along the border between Samaria and Galilee. As he was going into a village, ten men who had leprosy met him. They stood at a distance and called out in a loud voice. What did they call out? Jesus, Master, Master, catch that, have pity on us. When he saw them, he said, Go show yourselves to the priests. As they went, they were cleansed. But only one of them, when he saw that he was healed, came back praising God. The others just wanted what Jesus would provide for them. Even though they said, Master, we know you're Master, Jesus. We know you're Lord. We know you're from God. We don't want a Lord. We just want to be fixed. <clears throat> he came back praising God in a loud voice. He threw himself at Jesus' feet and thanked Him. And he was a Samaritan, a half-breed, one who didn't understand, hadn't been to church, one that didn't profess to know God's will, one of the people that we see that's the perfect Christian when we look at him. He just wanted, the nine just wanted the healing. But this person that didn't know better, that was saved out of their terrible life that appreciated what they got, they worship God. And Jesus asked in verse 17, we're not all ten clean, cleansed? Where are the other nine? Has no one returned to give praise to God except this foreigner? Then he said, rise and go, your faith has made you well. Where is our faith? Does our faith produce actions as James says? Can you show me your faith by your works? Do you appreciate what God does in your life? Are you willing to make Jesus Lord of your life and tap into the power of the Spirit? Faith, we believe by faith. Faith is what saves us. Faith is what also sanctifies us because we have to believe that the power of God does reside in us and has power over Satan. Whoever is not with me is against me, and whoever does not gather scatters. You can't be neutral. This man was neutral because he didn't clean up his life. I mean, he didn't fill his life. He did clean up his life. I can say I want to be a good person, and so many times a day if you ask people, how do you get to heaven? Well, if I'm good enough, right? We've heard that time and time again. But it's by grace we're saved. There is no good enough. There is no power in our own might to keep the devil from you. There is no power in your own might to save you. Jesus will save you and He will sustain you and carry you all through this world. Hebrews eleven six says, And without faith it is impossible to please God, because anyone who comes to Him must believe that He exists 
and that He rewards those who earnestly seek Him. So not only if we follow after Him, <laughs> we'll get rewards in heaven. Wow, what a good God we serve. James 2, 4 says, What good is it, brothers and sisters, if someone claims to have faith but has no deeds? Can such faith save them? James 2, 17 says, In the same way, faith by itself, if not accompanied by actions, is dead. If you have real saving faith, if you still have breath, you're not in the grave, then Jesus' commands are for you, and He's given you the power of the Spirit to live that life. Don't let yourself be beat up if you fall. Get right back up and ask God for more of the Holy Spirit, and He will give it to you. We've already seen that in this passage. You cannot be neutral. You need to say, fill her up, God. I'm ready. I'm obedient. But that wasn't all the scripture we read this morning. We read verse 27 and 28 also. And we need to tie this together. This isn't something separate because it says, as Jesus was saying these things. So right as he was doing this, this woman spoke up. I don't know why she spoke up. Maybe she spoke up because she didn't want the people accusing Jesus. Maybe she was sympathizing with Jesus. But she still didn't understand. Because what she said was, Blessed is the mother who gave birth to you and nursed you. Now that's biblical from Scripture. Mary was blessed. But, and Jesus didn't deny this, He replied, Blessed rather are those who hear the word of God and obey it. Mary is so blessed. She got to be Jesus' mother. Wow! But Jesus says... <laughs> Even more blessed. Listen to this, guys. You, so you can get the whole point of the story that I'm trying to tell you here, this whole passage. Those who hear the Word of God and just sit there and do nothing about it, ride the fence, are okay, right? No. Those who obey it. Those who obey the Word of God. If you really believe, you'll have those works. If you really believe, you'll give up your life to God. And He's given you the power to pull through this life. <clears throat> you cannot be neutral. I can't say it enough. It won't work. You can try it and try it and try it. And hopefully one day you'll figure it out. And God is who He says He is. He is God of all and He loves you so much. What greater love can someone have to lay down their life for their friends? If you truly believe, you will truly follow. I'd like to read one more passage that Luke has already recorded in Luke 8, verse 19 through 21. This is when Jesus was out performing miracles and he was so tired that he couldn't even eat. He was probably weak at his knees, everything else. And his mother and brothers were there. The disciples were there and they didn't have it figured out again. They didn't have that aha moment. There were people coming to Jesus and Jesus was willing to come to them. And he always is. He will never forsake you. If you come to Him, He is there for you all the time. In fact, like I said, He's residing inside of you. But they didn't understand this. It says, Now Jesus' mothers and brothers came to see Him, but they were not able to get near Him because of the crowd. What is this? I can't even get to my own son, to my brother, to, to my Lord. I'm His disciple. I can't get to for all these people here. Someone told him, your mothers and brothers are standing outside wanting to see you. So you would expect Jesus to say, i got to go now. My, my mother and brothers are over here. We'll see you. I'll be back tomorrow. Same time, same place, right? That's not what he says. He replied, and it's pretty harsh, my mother and brothers are those who hear God's words and put it into practice. The same thing that he's closed out Luke 11 with. There's no difference. Jesus doesn't change his teachings the teachings are the same. If you love me, you will obey my commandments. If you love the Father, you will follow after me, obey the commandments. So is Jesus your brother? Are you with Jesus or against Jesus? Is he your Lord? Will you let him fill her up? He's there, just waiting. God is always there. How much more will He give if you ask the Holy Spirit? And Satan knows that. If you're having trouble in your life and you say, fill her up, Jesus, I think there's a very good chance that the devil will flee from you. <clears throat> Father, we thank You so much that You love us, 
that you sent your only Son to die for us, and that He did not orphan us. Let us not look back to the disciples and say, oh, they walked with Jesus, because they're looking at us and say, wow, they have the Spirit of God living with them every day. They saw how the Spirit of God worked in their lives. They saw the church grow. They saw mighty works and acts. And they didn't even face death because they knew that it wasn't an end. It was just a beginning for them. That they would spend eternity by Jesus' side. Lord, we thank you for the privilege to worship you. We thank you for the freedoms that we have. Let us not take that for granted. But let us use the freedoms that we have to tell others about Jesus Christ. We thank you and praise you in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen.